Today's topic on the show is one that I really enjoy talking about, and I think is very impactful in trumpet design. If you've seen many trumpets or other brass instruments, you're probably familiar at this point with this yellowish hue here. This is the color of brass, which, shockingly, brass instruments get their name from. However, what happens when we start manufacturing parts of the trumpet out of other metal compositions? Today, on Trumpet Demystified, we discuss. We're now on episode 3 out of 6 of my senior project for the Gonzaga University Honors Program. In episode 1, we discussed the mouthpiece and how its many parameters can influence your experience on the trumpet. In episode 2, we talked about the many different shapes and sizes of tubing that you might find on the trumpet and how those can affect your experience. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about the metal composition of the trumpet, because as it turns out, not all trumpets are created equal, and some are not even machined from actual brass. Shall we discuss? The most common metal you'll encounter in trumpet design is unsurprisingly what we call yellow brass. If you want to see an example of a trumpet that is entirely yellow brass with no material variation whatsoever, take a look at my Yamaha YTR-8310Z, my main trumpet. Most trumpet parts are manufactured from yellow brass, which has a composition of 70% copper and 30% zinc. And there's a reason it's the industry standard. Every material composition in trumpet design has a subtly unique tonal pattern, and yellow brass is known for very much being the middle of the road. It's capable of both brightness at louder volumes and darkness at quieter volumes, but leans generally towards a rich and clear sort of tone that we come to expect from most brass instruments. Another thing you might encounter in the trumpet industry is brass alloys that have more copper and less zinc than the typical 70-30 split of yellow brass. These special alloys tend to go by names such as gold brass, red brass, or rose brass, depending A on the exact composition and B the brand or maker we're talking about, since not all of them agree on the exact compositions or verbiage used. But nonetheless, we can make a few general statements here. We'll start off with gold brass, which is probably the most commonly found and least dramatic of the extra copper alloys. It tends to be more than 70% copper, typically around 80 to 85, but it's not a hugely visually discernible difference. In fact, I lied to you. My Yamaha 8310Z actually has a gold brass lead pipe. While it does not have some of the other metal accents that some trumpets tend to have, it does have that gold brass lead pipe for good reason. That extra 15% copper provides a good amount of extra corrosion resistance, and that's very handy since the lead pipe tends to be where most of your leftover bacteria and cookie crumbs from your last meal end up in the instrument. So it's very handy to have a lead pipe that doesn't corrode as easily as yellow brass would. But that doesn't take full advantage of the sonic benefits of yellow brass. If you really want to take full advantage, then make your bell, at the very least, out of yellow brass. Now, if you know where to look, gold brass bells are actually not too uncommon in the industry. Typically, if you can find a Yamaha or Bach model number that ends in a G suffix, chances are pretty good that instrument has a bell made out of gold brass, such as the YTR4335G trumpet by Yamaha, or the cornet that I use for brass band use, the Bach 184G, although its gold brass bell is obviously hidden under a layer of silver plating. Now, we can still turn the copper dial a little higher to 90 or 95 percent, and by that point, we tend to be talking about an alloy called red brass. And at this point, we're in fairly specialized territory. It's not terribly common that you run into a red brass bell out in the wild, but they are striking when you do. For instance, on some discontinued Yamaha models, like my YTR332 trumpet or my YCR334 cornet, we can observe lacquered red brass bells that have a more pink or orange hue to them. And if we look at this big four-valve monster designed by Brent Peters of Pudgy Trumpets, we can see an unlacquered red brass bell, which has indeed turned the reddish-brown hue that its name would suggest. Now, don't get me wrong, I think these extra copper bells look very attractive on an instrument. But what I think is even more attractive is their sound and tonal benefits. The effect of adding more copper to brass, which strengthens the more copper you add, is less high frequencies in your sound. The extra copper sort of soaks up those high frequencies. And the effect of that is a tone that stays rich and warm and centered for a larger portion of your dynamic range. When you play a yellow brass trumpet, typically when you play softly it has a nice veiled sort of sound to it, but there's a switch that sort of flips around the forte mark where if you're blowing pretty hard, then the tone will become harsh and edgy and a lot more pointed and directional. The effect of a gold or red brass bell is that you have to kind of push up to fortissimo to change that sound. So when you're playing forte, you have a much more grounded sort of tone. I really like the ability to play with a dark sound for a larger portion of my dynamic range, and there are occasions where it is really, really helpful, like playing in smaller spaces, 
but there are also times where it can be a drawback, such as really pointing your sound in a large hall. So it's not always useful to have a red brass bell, but I really like its sonic benefits, personally speaking. Now, for some of you, this might be begging the question, well, can't we just do away with the zinc entirely and have a bell that's 100% copper that is the richest and darkest sounding bell of all and the hardest to push to a bright tone? And the answer to that is yes. For instance, the CG Con Company had a material they dubbed Coprion, or essentially 100% copper ions, which is where it gets its name, and that is essentially the biggest and darkest and huskiest sounding bell possible. We have here a Condirector Cornet, which has this Coprion bell, and we can also see some copper accenting, for instance, on this Getzen Super Deluxe Trumpet, although these are just small parts of the instrument, so it doesn't have a huge effect on how the instrument sounds. We'll notice that the copper tends to look a very deep shade of orange when it's lacquered over, whereas if you scratch off that lacquer, you're met with pink. And if you let that pink age and patina over time, it tends to turn this really, really attractive dark purple sort of color. Now a slight diversion here, if you want to hear the difference between a standard yellow brass and a fully copper bell on a trombone, I know it's not a trumpet, but the point stands regardless of which brass is from what we're talking about, you can check out this video up in the card, unrelated to Trumpet Demystified, but it should help to clarify some of the tonal effects I'm talking about here. Now, as is becoming a recurring theme here on Trumpet Demystified, we have our industry standard, which acts as a middle-of-the-road option, and on one side of the fence, we have one set of benefits and drawbacks, whereas on the other side of the fence, we have typically the opposite set of benefits and drawbacks. We've now talked about yellow brass, the middle of the road, and its many darker-sounding alternatives, so now let's talk about some of its brighter-sounding alternatives. In the interest of going from least to most extreme, we're going to start with one that's fairly uncommon, and that is bronze. Bronze is a really interesting one. Its effects have been explored, for instance, by the Holton Company on certain French horn bell flares, and more recently by Lotus mouthpieces. Bronze is capable of lighting up a little bit more easily and at a lower dynamic level than typical yellow brass. It's a slight difference, but I have a Lotus mouthpiece made from bronze, and even though its cup and inner diameter are very large, it does light up quite well when I push it as a result of being made from bronze. You might also occasionally run to a bell made of stainless steel or more likely sterling silver. These alloys are really cool. If you did a frequency analysis of a yellow brass bell, you'd find that it's got a good medium-high overtone presence, but in the highest frequencies, you start to see it peter off a little bit. Sterling silver will maintain a huge amount of frequency volume all the way up through the highest frequencies, meaning its tone is just massive and has a lot of carrying power and is very directional if you push it, and it's a lot of fun to play on a sterling silver bell. King used to do it fairly frequently with silver sonic instruments. I played a silver sonic 2B trombone that is just amazingly fun. It still has a nice sound, but you really can put a hole through a wall with it. Now we're at the point where we can talk about adding nickel to brass alloys. Nickel silver, or German silver as it was sometimes known in the past, is typically about 60% copper with the remaining 40% being some makeup of zinc and nickel where it gets its name from, although there isn't actually any silver present in the mix. It tends to have that dark silver hue, and as a result of that darker hue, some people will try and convince you that it has a darker sound, especially at softer dynamics. I'm here to rip the band-aid off and say that it's just absolutely demonstrably false, and it is one of those market myths that I warned you about in the last episode that we at Trumpet Demystified are here to debunk once and for all. But nonetheless, any amount of nickel added to brass makes it easier to strive for a bright and pointed tone, and you can do so from a lower dynamic level than brass or bronze. Part of the reason that misconception might occur as far as nickel silver being a darker material is because some instruments that utilize nickel silver are actually extremely dark sounding instruments that have been manufactured with nickel silver to sound a little bit brighter. For instance, my French horn is a Con Model 8D, a famously dark and rich sounding French horn. But that is not because of the nickel silver. That design, that wrapping style, just leads to a very dark sound, in addition to the bell throat and bell flare being rather massive. Whereas if you take the same instrument and manufacture it from yellow brass, you have the Con 28D. And that horn is famously, or infamously rather, almost too dark to use in most settings. So Con manufactures the same instrument much more commonly, out of nickel silver. So that at the softer dynamics, yes, you do have that velvety, veiled sort of horn tone, but when you push it, you get the Hollywood factor. You get a lot of punch in the sound. Something worth noting is that a lot of standard yellow brass trumpets will have nickel silver accenting in the form of outer slide tubes or, for instance, a two-piece valve baluster, and this tends not to have as severe of an effect as you might think. Sure, you can concentrate nickel silver in places like a two-piece valve baluster to sort of drizzle a little extra high-frequency sauce on your sound, 
but the fact that your tuning slide tubes are made out of nickel silver is not going to make a huge world of difference compared to if you made the whole bell out of it, for instance. Now, just like we mentioned with copper, yes, we could turn the nickel dial all the way up to 100 and manufacture out of pure nickel as a sort of magnification of the tendencies of nickel silver, just as Coprion was to higher copper content brass alloys. So, with pure nickel, you get the brightest and zippiest sort of tone possible. It's more feasible probably for mouthpieces than for entire instruments, and it's been explored once again by Lotus mouthpieces. They tend to have three different materials, brass, bronze, and nickel for their mouthpieces. And as you might suspect, the brass one is the darkest, the bronze one is in the middle, and lights up a little bit extra. And then, nickel mouthpieces really make it their mission to light up and have a very lively tone to them. Now I know people are going to ask about it, so this video wouldn't feel complete unless I talked about different finishing and plating materials for trumpets, but let's just immediately get the fact on the table that the sonic effects of plating and finishing are not nearly as severe as actually manufacturing the bell of the instrument out of a different material. This is just a very thin layer of coating that goes over whatever that base metal is. So if you get two identical instruments, one in silver plate and one in a clear lacquer finish, the sonic effects are going to be near indiscernible in a large concert hall, and truth be told, even from the player's perspective, it's in most cases not going to be enough to write home about. If you completely forego the step of lacquering or plating over a brass instrument, for one thing, you'll get a rather divisive patina, some will think it's very attractive and some will think it's rather ugly, but for another thing, it tends to have a very rich and wide and expansive sort of tone. The most common solution to preserving brass instruments is to coat them in a clear coat of lacquer, and that preserves the state of the metal that it's currently in, and moreover, it allows you to see the different metal composition throughout the horn, whether that's yellow brass, gold brass, red brass, nickel silver. For instance, my Yana 332 trumpet, you can still see sort of the tricolor scheme, even though it's got lacquer on it. And that maintains all of the typical bright and dark characteristics at different volumes of raw brass, but it compacts the sound a little bit. You can imagine that the lacquer clinging to the metal is sort of dampening some of the vibration. Alternatively, you can have your trumpet plated over with various metals. For instance, a silver or nickel finish could, in theory, brighten your instrument by a 2-3% type of factor. And the much less common and much more costly gold plating could, in theory, darken the instrument 2-3%. Typically not financially justifiable by any means. Now here's a really fun one just to throw a monkey wrench in the mix. Khan's Constellation Model 38B Trumpet. Its bell is supposedly made from yellow brass, then plated over with a thick layer of Khan's Coprion compound, or essentially a whole bunch of copper ions, then plated over with nickel, and then clear lacquered on top of that. That is just bizarre. It sounds like Khan was just throwing things at the wall until they got a tone that stuck. But in all honesty, the tone did stick. The 38B is a very highly regarded trumpet that is capable of a huge variety of different sounds. So maybe there is something to that. But I really should make the point that you should not be in a rush to strip the lacquer off your trumpet or spend a bunch of money to get it replated in silver or gold just with the intent of changing the sound. It really is not that big of an effect. So that at long last should finally put a bow on episode three of Trumpet Demystified on one of my favorite topics in the brass industry. I hope this video has cleared some stuff up for you or taught you something new. As a reminder, we've got one more Fundamentals episode coming down the pipeline very soon, and that's going to be on another very important element of trumpet design. And then, to round things off in episodes 5 and 6, we're going to shift the focus a little bit and talk more about how you as a player can find your ideal equipment that brings out your best qualities as a player and gives you what you need in your trumpet playing. Until then, thank you for your time, and stay tuned.